morning, Excellency ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to Cambodia Global Dialogue of Southeast Asia TV. Uh, for those who have not uh, watched uh, the show, um, let me just say briefly that it is an initiative where we try to invite whenever possible different personality from different parts of the world, uh, from the region, from uh, Cambodia, to come to speak about a, a certain theme that they are uh, considered as expert in their own right, uh, they have gone through their life, uh, and we hope that through a certain uh, frank exchange, we could uh, learn something from their particular experience that could be applied uh, to the Cambodian context, uh, and it could be in the form of a lesson learned, it could be in the form of experience sharing, it could be an initiative that they thought was good, and maybe somebody out there in the audience would find that the idea, the initiative is good and they could use it in, in, to change their life, to change their society, to change their policy, to change their way of doing things. Uh, today we have the pleasure to have a, uh, a, a good friend of mine which I, I have known for the last 15 years. Uh, her name is uh, you know, Patricia Ba. Uh, uh, good evening, Pat. Good evening. Uh, yes. Thank you for having uh, me. Uh, we, we, we're going to be talking quite a bit on something that is not uh, about economics or trade, which uh, you, you heard so, so many times already in the last four months. But we, we can talk about how uh, legislative drafting could help influence uh, policy development. And uh, Patricia is, is quite uh, an authority in terms of uh, legislative drafting. She's a former uh, general counsel for the D DC uh, administration. Uh, she's been working in, in policy development in so many years already in her life. But I probably would want to ask her to say something about herself. Pat, again, welcome to the show. And before we start, could you maybe share with the audience a bit what your background a bit, your, 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 your personal background? Okay, well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really honored that um, I would be considered um, for this program. Um, well, I came from North Carolina in the U.S., and uh, a major event in my life was being a Peace Corps volunteer in Malaysia from 1966 to 1970. And at that time, <coughs> sorry, I, it's okay. I passed uh, through Cambodia on my way back home, and I spent a week or two weeks in Cambodia in 1970, in 1970, um, January. So I didn't see enough of it, and it was trouble at the time, so we couldn't stay very long. Um, and after I went back, I decided to go to law school. I thought that being a lawyer would help me help people more. And so I went to school in the District of Columbia, and out of law school, I started working for the newly elected District of Columbia legislative body called the D.C. City Council. The District of Columbia is the only jurisdiction in the United States that does not have sovereignty. Mm. And so this has a lot of impacts on the kinds of controls that the local, the people living in the city of Washington, D.C. have over their daily lives. And after the civil rights movement, many of these civil rights workers who were from Washington, D.C., said, well, wait a minute, now that we have voting rights for African Americans, we've got a civil rights law, what about yeah. civil rights for the District of Columbia? And so there was a big push to um, get self-government for the district. Yeah. Shortly after I got out of law school, I w started working for them, and this was the first year of home rule for them. Ah, what do you mean by home rule? Home rule means that you have the right to elect your representatives and to have control over legislation that affects your daily lives. Yeah. Um, and it's limited in the district. There's still some things that they do not have full authority for. For example, tax money that's raised in the district has to be put in a budget that's approved by the U.S. Congress. I see. So. Every other state, for example, Maryland and Virginia, appoint their own judges, they have their own taxing authority, they can tax people who come in and out of the state, and they can decide on the form of government that they have by themselves. But the, in the District of Columbia, that's decided on by 
the Congress. Yes, yes. So there's very limited, it's very difficult for people to have their, their own form of government that responds to their needs. And yes, yes. So the first city council members were from the civil rights movement. Uh, none of them had ever worked in government. Many of them had worked only as civil rights workers, and so they had very little experience about mm. what to do. And of course, I had no experience either. Um, so it was a new experience for all of us. Um, some of the people who had been working under former appointed governors, yes. uh, appointed uh, council members who were usually appointed by the president of the U.S. Yes. So these people were in charge. So there were rules and there were laws. Yes. But now we had the authority to make our own laws and to have our own codes and everything else. It's quite a new about, experience. Yeah, speaking about uh, making own law, rules, <coughs> uh, this is where we, it leads to the thematic of today, of the tonight, the discussion is about legislative drafting. What, what is the, the challenge of you know, drafting uh, laws to reflect the policy, you know, whether DC government, whether in the context of Cambodia. Uh, what do you see basically the challenge in getting that legislative drafting going? Well, I think if you look at policy making, I mean, policy making, as I try to explain to people, especially when I've been teaching this subject, is it's a roadmap. And, and I told my students that if you're going to see Nickville, there are different ways that you can get there. Yes. And so you have to make a decision about whether you want to go the quickest way, the fastest way, the cheapest yes. way, or the long route where you can kind of look around. And so when you made a decision about where you're going and how, you know, drafting is how do you get there. Yes. So I think when you start out with a policy issue, you have to know where it is we want to be. Yes. And then it's a question of choosing among alternatives to mm -hmm. how do we get there. You've been in Cambodia for quite a while. <coughs> I mean, it's been, this is your 15 year of this in month, Cambodia. This month, yeah. Yeah, 15 years. 15 years. We know each other 15 years. We, we have many opportunities to work together in developing the commercial law for that matter. We, we, we have worked uh, uh, with my wife also in uh, the, the land law project. Right. Uh, you're quite involved in teaching the first batch of Cambodian uh, law student, lawyer who are now a uh, lawyer in their own right, successful. Right. Uh, what have you seen in the last 15 years from the day you came and you have your first class, your first exposure to the Cambodian uh, uh, sort of like a legal community, if, if I can be quite broad on that. I think what I've learned is that there's so many different viewpoints yes. on the table. Mm -hmm. And Cambodia has the benefit and I think the also it's a challenge from having so many experts from so many different jurisdictions. Yes. And so every jurisdiction is different. And I think what many of us came in with the idea that our jurisdiction was the best. I mean, that's kind of typical, I think. You know, we think ours is the best. And then for us, it's a, an unlearning and a relearning process. Yes. And what I have learned is that there are very competent people in the government. Yeah. And who have, and there is a tradition. Yeah. There is a legal tradition here, and it wasn't wiped out. People came back and mm. reinstituted things. Yeah. And um, I worked with people at the Ministry of Land who reconstructed and brought in all the documents that they could f put mm. together mm. and pulled all this stuff together to, to reform their legal tradition. Yeah. And we come in with an attitude that it doesn't exist. And so mm. for me, it's like, wait a minute, there is a tradition. Mm. It's not the same way as mine. Yeah. And how can we make that build on that mm. rather than transforming it into something that makes me feel comfortable or somebody from Australia or someone from France mm. feel more comfortable? In fact, there is a tradition here and we need to help focus on what that is. Mm. And so from us coming from a common law 
uh, jurisdictions, we're, we're like always thinking our way is like, oh dear, this civil code way of looking at things is yes. very different. But it's not, it works. And so mm. we have to just fit into that. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you see this, uh, this issue of Anglo-Saxon common law, civil code, is, is really, it's a non-issue per se. It, it's, it's a false dialogue in a way that in the Cambodian context, both could cohabitate. Well, it, well, there is a, first of all, there is a Cambodian legal tradition. Exactly. And people know that. Yes. They've, they've lived with it. Even, yes. even people who are uneducated know what the system is. Yes. <clears throat> so, if you uh, are, if you want to build on something, you want to educate people and get them system functioning, you have to really start where it is. Mm. And so, yeah, it's not our decision or any of the foreigners' decisions about whether this system is better or that system is better. It's what system is here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, it is a non-issue in, in a lot of ways because the two jurisdictions, the two traditions, right, really, yeah. are becoming closer and closer anyway. So there's so little major distinctions yeah. between the two systems these days. You know, I, I, I can't help but to say that Cambodia in the last uh, pretty much almost 20 years since the Paris Peace Accord, Cambodia have fully reintegrated into the region, into the world, into the sub-region. We are a major player in, in, in that sense. I think uh, the, for me, I see the, the, his excellency and like Prime Minister Hun Sen, He's a, he's a fervent believer of economic liberalization. Right? And this also has a tremendous impact on the legislative drafting in itself, in the sense that when you're going to be a member of the WTO, many of law, say for example intellectual property, is very much driven by internationalization of the intellectual property. Right. It's not necessarily a Cambodia trademark law or a Thai or a Singapore or a French trademark law. It's very much modeled after an, an international norm. In four more years, we'll be a member of the ASEAN economic community. Cambodia have ratified, my God, how many in legal instruments, you know, that we're going to be part of this, uh, this 10 ASEAN country, you know, one same rule, one same uh, uh, sort of like norm. So more and more, Cambodia legal system or institutional system is sort of like, you know, getting, I would say, accustomed or adjusted to that. So in this context, I do not really see the fear of some people that Cambodia is too uh, much in one side or the other. But from the, the ground path, as, as a teacher, as a professor of law, right, you, what have you seen in the development of the legislative drafting, you see a, a, a progress toward sort of like self-actualization that they, they, they can now look at a, a policy, uh, they can look at the, a certain draft law that they, can they do it by themselves now? Well, I think, I think so. I think there's a lot, I work with people that I think have a lot of, of, of uh, skills for this, but let's be real about this. Do you think anybody in the U.S. Congress drafts a law by themselves? Of course not. It is a huge effort of bringing all different voices in. I remember the first time we had the Uniform Commercial Code. It's like, wait a minute, what even is this? <laughs> we brought in UCC experts to help us. We yes. didn't begin to tackle that. Yes. We would have never thought about doing that, but what we what we could do locally in terms of functioning is how do we bring that body of law to the implementation in the country because that's where the issues are going to be. It's mm. not that we don't have the body of laws. It's yes. How do we come up with practical steps for implementation mm. and how do we decide when we're looking at legislation that mm. we can actually do it. Yes, yes. And I think that's where the real challenges are is how much, it's not about what is a nice law because yeah, many yeah. people can write a beautiful law, yeah. but what are you going to do with it? How many people does it take to implement this mm -hmm, law? Mm -hmm. And so one example that I use is 
when you develop a process yeah. that's something out in the districts, yeah. and, and we, if you've ever been to a district, which you have, yes. and most policy people in the government have been to the districts and they know what's in their districts. So if you're going to have a requirement that you have <clears throat> all these forms and they have to be photocopied, then, yes. well, wait a minute, do we have photocopies there? Mm. Do we have people who can read these forms? Do we have an office there? Do they have electricity? Yes, and those yes. are the kinds of issues that need to be thought about in developing mm. the, in implementing the policy because in fact you can, a law is not a, a law is just a statement and law is not an implementation. It has to be put into practice. Mm. And so you can have a beautiful law that's not capable of implementation for usually human resources or financial resource mm. reasons and also so people tend to lose respect for the law mm. when you can't enforce it and when it can't yes, be implemented exactly. so the law is seen as the law yes and then what we do is reality yes so i think having a the ability to bring all of this legislative wanting to move really quickly wanting to do a lot of important yeah. legislation but it has to be brought down to the level, what can we do right now? Are, are you saying that we, for legislative drafter, they have to be more mindful of the connectivity with the, their, their environment? Right. Uh, in the sense that, yes, the law serves a good purpose, right. but if you do not take into account the implementing side of it, the human resource, the capacity building of this human resource, right. uh, the institutional uh, setting in itself, it may not work. Is that what you're saying? Well, it won't work if you can't do it. I mean, yeah. the law doesn't do anything by itself. Yes. So it may look good. You may have all these processes in there that are mm. international best practices. Mm. But when you can't, you haven't achieved anything except a law. Mm. And then People are saying, well, it's not being implemented. Well, we can implement mm, it. Mm. So, yes, you have policymakers. In this case, because most of the drafting here is done at the ministry level, yeah, yeah. ministers really have to look at, can my agency do this? Mm. And what do we need to do this? And one of the things that we had to do in, in D.C., and it's happening more here, is we had to do fiscal impact mm. and impact on other laws. Okay. And the, when you drafted a law, it had to be accompanied by a report. Mm. And it had to detail what is the fiscal impact? How much is it going to cost to us cost. to implement this law exactly. as we have it exactly. written? Yes. And then what is the impact on mm. the other law? How does it impact the civil code? Mm. How does it impact mm. the forestry law? Mm. How does it impact the... Um, environmental laws yes, yes and how do these and so if you can't just do it in a in one yes one little square it has yes. to be looked at as the whole i would even go further than that that you mentioned a lot of the impact which is more the consequence of uh, what what uh, what would be uh, the implementation of that law on the other, but I would go further that you know that the challenge you know, is how do you disseminate how do you get the actual stakeholder, which is the population <coughs> to, to to understand that and how I see the challenge of Cambodia moving forward is we have adopted a lot of law, we have passed a lot of law. For the parliament have ratified many conventions, treaties, uh, government uh, to government agreement. But to what extent the actual beneficiary, it could be private sector for that matter, if, if I'm speaking about ASEAN-China uh, free trade agreement or ASEAN-Australia-New Zealand free trade agreement, there are opportunity, uh, business, economic, trade, uh, activity behind that. That's why we enter into a free trade agreement right. because we look at, you know, a economic opportunity. But how many of the real actor, which is the private sector, the the exporter, the importer, the in uh, the, the the manufacturer, you know, the trader, how much do these folk, who are supposed to be the beneficiary of many of these agreements, do understand, you know, the implication? So so here I see fiscal impact one thing, but 
we go beyond that. We have to look for more value extraction for that particular law, that particular convention that we're going to sign or we're going to ratify. I think it's important because if not, you, you keep passing law because somebody say, well, you need to pass a law. And I, I, I have no guilt to say that when we negotiate the Cambodia accent WTO, we, we have a commit to a national legislative action right. plan. Six years later, we've done a lot. But how much is the impact assessment that you have mentioned? Have we done? I still doubt that. So perhaps this could be an opportunity for some ministry to reassess, to say, hmm, I passed three law already since, uh, you know, Cambodia entered WTO. But I wonder, six years later, what is the impact assessment of that particular law? What do you think? Well, I think that's an ongoing oversight function of, <coughs> of the ministries to, to monitor the implementation of their law. And I, th I think that probably ministers are doing that, but perhaps not on a formal way. But, um, and also there's an, another, um, I, I, a couple of things that you mentioned about dissemination yes. about all of this. And there's a lot of effort on dissemination. And one of the things that brought us, that actually made, and was the reason we first started working together, yeah was that you were compiling all the laws mm -hmm. in 1995 when you were working with UNDP. So the, the idea is people have to be able to have the law. Yes. They have to be able to have access to yeah. it. And so you're talking about different, but different stakeholders. So educated people, business people need access to this law. And People who are uneducated are also affected by the law, and they need other yes. means of being brought into this. And I think that land law is one of the areas where this has been especially good. And mm. of course, I'll take some of the credit, yes. but I also think the Ministry of Land has to take a lot of most of the credit. Yeah, yes. because they've really, really they worked on job. this. I mean, they've really, really worked on yes. it in a lot of different ways, and they have a really good, uh, especially in the titling yeah, aspect yeah. of it. But what we worked with, um, and we just finished a project with the EU and another project funded by the State yeah. Department, U.S. State Department, of dissemination of land law yes. information yes. for people who are uneducated. Hmm. And we used Cambodian traditional theater and puppets and other things, and we did a traveling road show hmm. Hmm. where we spent a long time working with people to try to, we, we developed what we called a land law literacy mm. curriculum about yeah. seven things that people need to know, mm. seven or eight things. Mm. What are the most important things that people need to know? Everybody needs mm. to know about the land law. And then we tailored the, uh, you know, we went back and forth on these seven things. You know, what is the lawful possession? Mm. Uh, what is state public land? What is, you know, when is the date of the law and when can your Mm. Uh, occupation take mm. place and all of these key points and we go and what happens when you have a conflict mm. who should you go to we mm. went over and over with these things and we found that people were really struggling to learn it mm. because they've never learned yeah, they've never yeah. been in school we, we're closing uh, soon because it's, oh, a, it's, it's up a, already <laughs> i know <laughs> 30 is minutes up. is quite My short goodness. but i i want to tell them something that is quite new which is uh, i know you've been involved in helping the, the, the Parliamentary Center? Parliamentary, Parliamentary Institute of Cambodia. Yes, Parliamentary yeah. Institute of Cambodia. Tell me right. a bit about that. Well, yes, and this, uh, this is actually a nice segue because the Parliament has a big role, mm. should have a big role in the oversight yeah. of the way the laws are implemented because they are the representatives of the people. And yeah. they, they, they do need to have to be able to form this function. And the... Um, the genesis for the Parliamentary Institute of Cambodia started with the um, Canadian-funded project yes. called the Can Cambodian Canadian Legislative Support Project. Yes. And as a result of that, I think it had a, a lot of success, and, and the members of the parliament really were um, really liked the yeah. results, and they wanted to. They felt it helped them become more effective, and so they then led the uh, momentum to start this Parliamentary, in Parliamentary Institute of Cambodia. It's a non-profit, non-political, and it is an independent. It's mm. independent of the political body itself. But its purpose is to serve mm. 
the research and um, research and resource development for the parliament. Well, Pat, um, I, I must say that uh, that's something uh, a, a good uh, a place to stop. But uh, I just want to say that I, you know, all the law that I have compiled all this year, I have made as a contribution yes, indeed. To, to them and they yes. have, uh, the Senate is putting all this law into the website including many of the law you you find from your project you know right, right there <laughs> right. so so this is to me is uh, the genesis of something uh, Cambodian uh, something that we have learned from the outside uh, right. and at one point uh, Cambodia is uh, feel confident that now we are in position to start our own indigenous uh, learning uh, process and perhaps uh, this is something that we, we look forward for uh, a more proactive parliamentarian that can have access to good uh, uh, drafting, research, uh, uh, support to help improve uh, this oversight uh, aspect of it. Well, yeah. they also, they also this, they can also help in the sense of dissemination of information and, and particularly in oversight and talking to their constituents about how laws are working on the ground, yes. which is a really important yeah. aspect for them to do. Well, Pat, I think fortunately we, we, we're coming to the <laughs> end and uh, it's always a short uh, moment when we start already engaging to the right. issue. But uh, let me formally say thanks on behalf of the station, right. perhaps also on behalf of the audience. So, uh, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're coming to the end of the program. And I hope you, for a law student, for a law professor, for a policy maker, for a parliamentarian, I hope you will find this session, uh, you know, uh, fruitful. And anything we, particularly Pat, Pat is in Cambodia, and uh, if you find that you want to reach out to her for more advice, for more insight uh, on legislative drafting in policy making, I'm pretty sure Pat will be happy to 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 give a helping hand once again. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, you know sparing the time to listen to our show. Thank you. Good night.